Hey everybody, it's Mike Peasall, pastor at Gateway Christian Center, and uh, today is Wednesday, November the 15th, and this is Mike's midweek message. Um, uh, no shave November, coming in good there. Uh, I've noticed that um, every year the beard is wider and wider, and uh, what are you going to do? So uh, anyway, today's, today's uh, topic, um, our title is For Such a Time as This. Now, uh, some of you may immediately know wh where that where that phrase comes from for such a time as this. Um, and, and some of you may not. And so t today, part of what I'm going to share is, is explaining where that comes from. It actually comes from the book of Esther. Um, Esther was, uh, was a young woman. She was, uh, uh, she was orphaned. Um, her, um, um, it, it, her, her father's nephew uh, adopts her, basically, so they're probably or close to the same age. Sometimes we th we think of of the the uncle as her her her, her um, adopted father as being quite a bit older. I think they probably were pretty close to the same age. At any rate, um, it was in the time of of the Bible that um, that you know Nehemiah and and uh, and Daniel. Those are those all those. Um, prophets happen in very similar timeline and so um it's it's a story that we i encourage you to read it it's it's like one of the to me it's one of the most easy to read books in the old testament um and it's like made for you know made for tv movie kind of kind of script but but when you read the book of esther you find you find that um uh, that phrase for such a time as this now what we mean by that is that um, that there are people who seem to be uh, born for a particular time, for a particular season, uh, or or they they um, they step forward um, at just the right time. They fill a gap. They fill a void. They they are uh, they're used by God at a particular time for a particular thing. So we would say that that you know that person is for such a time as this, and and the fact of the matter is that every Every believer is a for such a time as this person, or maybe multiple times in your life. And right now, I think for the church, for Christians, um, we are uh, we are set aside for such a time as this, where we have to continue to proclaim the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to continue to to uh, promote and um, and to depend on. Um, the Bible as being God's word and uh, and letting it be uh, our what we filter our worldview through our biblical worldview. So, anyways, back to the story. For those of you who don't know, um, the main characters in this in this story, <coughs> excuse me, um, are, are a king um, and his name is Ahasuerus or something like that. I don't know. I don't I don't speak whatever language that is. Um, but he, he reigns over 127 provinces in India and Ethiopia. Queen Vashti, who is his current wife, apparently a very beautiful woman, uh, but she had an attitude. There is a Jew named Mordecai, um, his adopted daughter Esther, and then a political climber insider named Haman, the Agagite. Agagite, I feel like um, um, I'm doing my... Popeye imitation there, Agagite. So the king is throwing a party, and he's really trying to impress everybody with his wealth. And and uh, you know that's part of being a king. Uh, let everybody see all the wealth that he has and all the power that he has. And and at some point he wants to show off his beautiful wife, Queen Vashti. And so he calls for Queen Vashti, and Queen Vashti decides, you know what? Uh, I'm not going. I don't feel like going. I'm, you know, what, what do you, who do you think you are, the king or something? Um, and so she, she says no. Well, this infuriates the king, and so basically, rather than kill her, which he probably could have done, he basically says, "You will never see my face again, and I'm going to replace you as queen." So, so she goes from having all this um, royal, um, uh, you know, position. To now, she basically has become a really well cared for uh, prisoner. Okay, so then an, another part of the story is is Mordecai, this Jewish guy who is uh, he's one of the servants um, who serves the king in, in a certain capacity. He's just one of many, and um, he one night overhears that there's these two guys that are planning on killing the king, and so he gets word to the king 
that there's an attempt, there's going to be an assassination attempt on your life. Well, uh, they, they investigate it and it turns out he was right. And so it's written down in the book of remembrance that uh, this guy on this day saved the king's life and these two guys were found guilty and they were, and they were uh, you know, executed. So, okay, that's pretty important. That's an important part of the story. And then uh, the king decides he wants a new bride. And so he sends out through all the country. I want to find every uh, beautiful young virgin. I want them to come in. There was this long, like almost a year long process of getting them, um, uh, you know, with, with the oils and the creams and the right diet and all this stuff because they wanted to present the absolute best um, that they had. And so one of the ones that that gets presented is Esther. Now, again, Mordecai is her adopted father. And so Mordecai has uh, some position in the kingdom. Um, the king is so smitten by Esther that he became, he, he basically makes her his new queen. So apparently Esther was a, was a beautiful woman and she was inspired by God for such a time as this. Okay. And then you have the political insider, the climber, his name was Haman. Now, there, there are a lot of things that we could say are probably good about Haman, but Haman thought a little bit more of himself than he should. And at some point, it seems like on the on the uh, on on the news of uh, the king being saved by Mordecai, Haman somehow gets some benefit out of that, and he's elevated to be like the top dog. And from now on, you're you're the top guy in in the king's administration. And uh, so he loved that. And he would walk around with his new robe and his new ring and his new, his new all this stuff. And, and, uh, and everybody would bow and scrape at him and he loved it. But there was this one guy named Mordecai who was like, I'm not doing that. I will bow to the king out of reverence to my God and my king, but I'm not going to, I don't bow, I don't bow to men. I will bow to the king. I will bow to that position because I believe that even, even though it's not a it's not a Jewish uh, king, even though it's it's a different culture, this is where I'm at. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, respond to the authority over me, but I'm not gonna bow and scrape to Mordecai. Now we don't know that he did anything. Uh, uh, Mordecai would not do that to Haman. We don't know that that he, that Mordecai did anything negative to Haman. We just know that it really incensed Haman that Mordecai would not bow to him. So he comes up with an idea. You know what? I'm going to eliminate this guy Mordecai. Well, how can I eliminate the guy Mordecai? I know I will eliminate everybody who is the same race as Mordecai. The problem is he didn't realize that um, that the new wife of the king, Queen Esther, was herself part of that that Jewish nation that Mordecai and Esther were part of that Jewish nation. And so here's where Mordecai goes to <clears throat> Esther and he says, Esther, you need to go to the king and you need to, you need to tell the king uh, what the plan is that Haman has because, because he's gotten the king to sign off on this and it's going to happen. And, uh, it, and we, we need to take action. And, and we, be, I believe that God has prepared you for such a time as this. He's taken this Jewish girl away from her family, away from her home, placed you in, in a position of great influence over the king, over 127 provinces. And you, you have the king's ear and now is the time. And so, um, there was a rule though, that you couldn't go and just walk into the king's chambers. You had to be summoned. If you came into the king's chambers, chambers and you hadn't been summoned and he didn't want you to be there and he basically ignored you, you could actually be killed or, you know, be, be removed like Queen Vashti was. But if he, but if he took his golden scepter and he, and he pointed it at you, it was his way of saying, Hey, come on in. It's good to see you. So, so Queen Esther goes, um, the king is like, Hey, what, whatever you want. She goes, I, I want to invite you and Haman to dinner. They go, they have a great time. The king is like, you can have anything you want up to half of my kingdom. And she goes, well, really what I want is for you to come back tomorrow night and have dinner again. And so they do. And then at that point, she reveals that um, that that Haman has set up a plan to uh, to kill not just Mordecai, but all of the Jews, including her. Now, in between the story, um, there, there's a time where uh, the king couldn't sleep, and so he he said, "Hey, uh, let's. I'm 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 not able to sleep. 
let me have somebody read to me. And, and I, you know, reading the minutes of, of uh, all the things that he's thought or he said, maybe he thought that would help him relax or go to sleep or whatever. But as they're reading through these things, they, they remind him of the day that this guy named Mordecai saved his life by reporting the, the assassination attempt. And so he says, well, what did we do for that guy? And they're like, didn't do anything for him, you know, uh, nothing. And so then, so he calls for Haman and Haman comes in and he says to Haman, he goes, hey, what's the best way for me to honor, um, honor somebody who has done me a great service? And Haman immediately thinks, oh, you're talking about me. And so he goes, well, you know, I would, I would uh, give him one of your robes, something you've worn, give, put him on a horse that you've ridden, give him, give him something that, that and let everybody see just how awesome I am. I mean, this person is. And so, um, the king looks at him and he goes, that's a great idea. Hey, I want you to go gather up all that stuff and go do that for Mordecai. Oh, Haman is like, oh, could it be any worse? But he's still in the back of his mind. He goes, well, okay, I'm going to do this, but Mordecai is going to be dead very, very shortly because of the, the scheme that I have. So when when Esther reveals this plan, um, she she basically... The king is so incensed at what she has said and how she is presented and how she's just basically said, the king, this is not about me, but this is about my people. If 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 you're going to throw me out, if even if you're going to kill me, spare my people. And so um, the king was kind of stuck in a situation because he'd already made a decree and kings just couldn't go back on their decree. So he allowed another decree to be said. And this decree was that, yes, there was this uh, decree where all the Jews could be killed on this certain day, but he he also put a decree in there that all those Jews could defend themselves in mass. And so it's kind of interesting with what we have going on right now in the Middle East. So the king wisely, he counterbalanced these uh, these two um, edicts that he'd made to where they kind of just canceled each other out. It's like, look, you're more than welcome to try to kill a Jew, but but the government is not going to help you do that, and they can fight back. And trust me, they will fight back. So there's a lot of different things that, that you know, are going on here. And, and uh, so Queen Vasti, Esther, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. But Queen Vasti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. Uh, at this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Um, and, and here's a little tip. When the king calls you, you should respond. Uh, don't be arrogant. Don't be don't be boastful. Don't be don't be prideful. Uh, just when someone in authority res calls for you, you should you should respond because people in authority also have uh, the authority to to uh, punish you. Um, Esther two twenty three. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So the king was very interested in punishing the two guys who had uh, planned his execution or, or planned his assassination, but he gave no thought to Mordecai, but they did write it down. When someone does something for you, when someone saves your life, um, why not go ahead right then and just say, how can I thank you? How can I repay you? How can I honor you? You did something for me. I want to do something for you. Um, it's not it's it's not do something so someone will do for you, but it's when someone does something for you, uh, appreciate it, uh, respond to it, reward it, um, because we all know that that if when we're rewarded for doing something that's good, we're more likely to do good things in the future, and other people are more likely to do good things in the future when we honor and recognize. I'm I'm kind of bad about um, rewarding people. Um, I just figure everybody's doing their job, and I have to remind myself sometimes it's it's a good thing to pull people aside and say, hey, good job. You really did a good job. I want to bless you in some way. Okay, so another, another little uh, life lesson that comes out of this is in Esther chapter 3, uh, verses 2 and verses 6. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahushasus. <laughs> um, 
So Haman had, he had the great position. He had the king's favor. He was wearing the king's ring. He could, he could, he could make declarations literally for the king. He was so, he was so um, fragile in his own um, opinion of himself that one guy, one guy drove him to want to kill an entire race of people. One, one man's refusal to bow to him enraged him in, in such a way that he was willing to just basically wipe out an entire uh, ethnic group of people. Okay, th first of all, how wrong is that? That you're, you're, you're willing to, to eliminate an entire group of people to, to just take out one person. But even more than that, that you are, you, you, you've, you're going to eventually give up all of the things that you have so that you can pursue that one thing you don't have. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's kind of important, but here's how I, <clears throat> here's how I see this as it applies to me and to you as believers, as the bride of Christ, as the bride of Christ, we should do what our King asks us to do. He's a good King. He's a good, good father. He's a good King. He's a, he's a righteous King. He's a righteous uh, uh, and, and loving and kind king. Yes, he is holy. And, and yes, he is just, but he's also merciful and kind and loving. And so when our king asks us to do something, we should go, okay, king, I, I love you and I will do. And you love me, so I will do what you've asked me to do. Okay, here's another one. Uh, Jesus has literally given his life for ours. So we don't, uh, we don't just want to recognize that, but we want to live our life in such a way that shows gratitude and honor. Just like, just like when uh, when Mordecai sent word to the king and it saved his, the king's life, and he, he didn't take the opportunity then. Think about what Jesus has done for us. We were dead in the trespasses and sins. We were we were chained to sin and hell and death, and Jesus broke the chains of sin and hell and death. He's done that for us. What can we do for him out of out of gratitude, out of thank you, thankfulness? You know, it says that God 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 prefers uh, uh, God prefers sac um, worship over sacrifice, and and what God wants from us is for us to live an obedient life, not not out of duty, but out of out of love and out of admiration for what He's done for us. And then finally, and I, I know this has been kind of a long one, um, you're made in the likeness and image of God. God is the one who determines your value, like Haman, okay? Um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, you get slighted in some way, don't overreact. Given that you will have a disagreement with everybody about something, think about that, you, you will eventually disagree with everybody about something, don't allow yourself to destroy everything because there's one difference you have with a person. Um, it's, it's okay. If, if everybody thought like you, you, you think it would be awesome, but it would, it would, there, there are things that just wouldn't happen. If everybody thought, if everybody thought like me, um, there are a lot of things that would just never get done. Um, if everybody thought like my wife, there are a lot of things that would never get done. We, we are put together as parts of a body. No one of us is completely, uh, um, perfect without, the team that God puts around us, the body that God puts around us. So um, I hope you have an incredible week. Next week, uh, of course, is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and uh, I will uh, I will be here with a midweek message. And I hope as you prepare for Thanksgiving that God will bless you and your family. We love you and have a great week.